And now, a WFXR special presentation honoring black history. Good evening, I'm Hazel Marie Anderson. And I'm Jermaine Farrell. Thank you so much for joining us as WFXR, we honor black history. Now, history means many things. It's not just about the past. There's history being written all around us and more to be written in years to come. And we'll have a look at all kinds of history throughout Southwest Virginia, starting right here in Roanoke. That's right, specifically the neighborhoods that for decades flourished as the heartbeat of Roanoke's black community. And while for those days, well, they're gone, a local artist is making sure they're never forgotten. The smells coming from the different restaurants and hotels, the, the horns blowing, people chattering, smoke rising from the buildings. It was just something that he loved to see on a, each and every day of his life. David Ramey Jr. is talking about the community his father grew up in, the 40s through the 60s, the lively Northeast and Gainesboro area in Roanoke. It was a community within a city. It was a city within a city. And at that time, a rare place where African Americans didn't have to worry about segregation. When you were in the Northeast Gainesboro area, you didn't have to worry about that. You drank from whatever fountain that was there that was a public fountain. You didn't have to worry about stepping to the side um, of the sidewalk to let someone else who's not your race go past. According to the Gainesboro History Project, the area held 1,600 homes, several schools, more than 20 churches, and countless businesses is now a distant memory. David Ramey, you know, in the later years of his life, really managed to record from memory uh, even without the use of photographs, which I find so amazing. Split between the Harrison Museum of African American Culture and the Tubman Museum of Art, people can travel the once vibrant neighborhood and view 200 drawings paired with 150 stories. The man um, was a unique talent, I think, that comes along, you know, maybe once or twice a century. There are no photographs, or if there are, there are very few that could illustrate what he is doing from a personal perspective. David, a self-taught artist, takes people like Charles Price back into time to the neighborhood he remembers before it was demolished. To be able to see something that your mind had, you know, you, you could think about but really not illustrate it. David has done that. He has pulled things out that, oh yeah, I remember that or yeah, that's how we stood on the corner. The Berglin Center, uh, McDonald's, all of those places used to be homes and businesses. David Sr. is gone, but his work ensures those memories and his memory will always stay alive. That was his legacy to, to uh, not only make sure that they could see the images, but they could read and the stories and learn about how it was and just uh, different things about it. David Ramey Jr. tells me that he hopes his father's work not only lives on at Roanoke Museums, but eventually travels to others. Now for now, you can catch the exhibition through March 30th. Jermaine. Thanks so much, Hazel Marie. Great work as always. Now, Roanoke College made history of its own this past year when Curtis Campbell took over as the Maroons athletic director. It is a happy homecoming for the Pulaski County native who became the school's first ever African-American AD. The road had its ups and downs, but he tells me he would not have had it any other way. For Roanoke College athletic director Curtis Campbell, he got a big dose of education from growing up in Pulaski County when he joined the Army during his basic training in Fort McClellan, Alabama. It was a good experience for me. You know, I tell people that uh, being in the Army was really my first experience with real diversity. You know, in Pulaski, we had primarily just black and white. And you know, we had in the Army, it was my first exper real experience with Latino Americans, Asian Americans, you know, and even New Yorkers who I thought were sort of, you know, the accents and stuff was were different. And so that was my first true experience uh, with diversity and, and learning about people. Campbell served for three years in the Army as a military police officer and in supply. 
If you've ever been in the Army, supply is a great gig. It is a great job. You know, you get to, to learn uh, a lot of things and, and uh, uh, you're everybody's friend when you work in supply. Growing up in Pulaski, Campbell was thankful for all of his role models to get him where he is today, especially when it comes to education. And then I did have some good uh, African-American role models, Mickey Hickman, Arthur Johnson, Joe Sheffy, you know, Joe Reed. There were some folks, and again, they were all in the education system. And so those were black males that I looked up to and aspired to be like. And uh, so I think I had uh, uh, the best of both worlds. Campbell overall looks at the history he is making, being the first African-American athletic director in Roanoke College history, as an important responsibility. It means I got to do a good job. And, you know, I think there's always a little bit more of a weight on your shoulder when you're the first, because you don't want to be the last. And so you feel a little bit more pressure to make sure you do things the right way and to make sure that people recognize uh, your, your competency and skill in doing the position so that, you know, the next time there's an opportunity to hire somebody of color to sit in that seat, there's no reluctance, there's no, yeah, you know, because we've had one before and they did a great job for us. And so I think any time you have that first attached to something, it does put a little bit more weight in the summertime on your shoulders to make sure you do a good job. Now, Campbell is now one of two African-American 80s in the Old Dominion Athletic Conference, along with Cleve Adams at Ferrum Colleges down the road. We'll have his story a little bit later in the show. Hazel Marie. Thanks, Jermaine. Well, our area is rich in sports history, especially for African-Americans. That includes Southside native Wendell Scott, who helped break the mold in NASCAR more than half a century ago. Now, decades after his death, Scott's story continues to inspire local children to break barriers of their own. WFXR's Rian Lowndes explains. So my grandfather's footprint can be found throughout the entire Southside. Wendell Scott was the first African American to compete in and win NASCAR at its highest level. With 495 career starts, 147 top 10 finishes, and 20 top 5 finishes, it's no wonder the Danville native is immortalized in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. He's the only African American inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame as well as um, the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. And you know, a lot of that, like I said, can be found right here in, the, in Martinsville because the Martinsville Speedway was a key track for my grandfather. According to the NASCAR Hall of Fame, Scott raced for the first time on a dirt track at the Danville Fairgrounds in 1952. He went on to compete around the country, but he was turned away from hotels as he raced through the segregated South. Despite adversity in 1963, Scott won first place in the Jacksonville 200. But NASCAR wouldn't admit that victory until hours later, and only after photographers and the crowd had left the track. He never even got his winning trophy during his lifetime. It was finally delivered to his family in 2021, nearly 60 years after his win. You know, imagine him traveling unsponsored his entire NASCAR career around the country. And so being able to race locally or being able to race at home meant a lot, not just to him, but it meant a lot to the community and to the family and the friends. People really got a chance to come and see him um, at Marsville. That connection to community lives on in the Wendell Scott Foundation, a STEM-focused education initiative. Warwick Scott is CEO and Scott's grandson. He had to drop out of school around the seventh, seventh or eighth grade um, to take care of his family and to help take care of his sisters. Um, and so at an early age, even before he became a NASCAR driver, he was a hustler and he was doing things um, to make money for his family. But it always stuck with him that he had to drop out of school. Um, when we talk about Wendell Scott and his ingenuity and how he was able to compete full time without the benefit of a sponsor, we realize that he was an engineer without the benefit of a formal education. Now, I come from a family of educators, both my mother and my father um, are school teachers. And so we found education to be a key vehicle for us to level the playing field for students that are underserved or, you know, being overshadowed or, or considered to be the underdog. Scott says the STEM educational divide is the next barrier the Scott name will break. We, we exist to lift up my grandfather's name and his legacy um, with his career in NASCAR and who he was as a community hero. In Martinsville, Rian Lowndes, WFXR News. 
Well, next week will mark 63 years since Scott's premiere series debuted, finishing second to last. But as we both know, and you at home, the best was yet to come. Isn't that the truth, Ms. Hazelry? Now, the foundation is now getting ready for the Wendell Scott Legacy Gala. That'll be on May the 4th at the NASCAR Hall of Fame in Charlotte. He walks our sidelines of football, basketball games. He comes to Adam Ward. Everybody knows who this gentleman is. Well, we certainly know who Jermaine is, but how many of you know how big of an impact he is to our area? Stick around and find out. We now return to Honoring Black History. Well, as we continue to honor black history, the Roanoke chapter of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is honoring this guy that's standing right next to me. WFXR's Amari Williams has more on the award and why it means so much to the organization, to Jermaine and all of us. This year, the SCLC celebrated its 27th luncheon, a time when they give out awards to those uplifting the community. One of those awards, the Dr. Preneller Chubb Wilson Award, is named after the 90-year-old woman who brought the organization to Roanoke. She says there's a thoughtful process for those she nominates. I have to sit down and think just what people are doing before we honor them to make sure they are doing what Dr. Martin Luther King would like. And what he stood for and what he did for us. Dr. Chubb Wilson says something the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood for was uplifting youth in the community, something she says this year's winner certainly does. He don't mind donating, giving of his time, talking to children and everything. And anytime anybody's out here to help our young people, I'm for them. This year, that special honoree was WFXR's sports director, Jermaine Farrell, celebrating over eight years of hard work and dedication to uplift youth in the Roanoke Valley and throughout Southwest Virginia. They called me and they said, hey, we want you to present you with this award, and it's the weekend of, the, of Dr. King and everything, so it's really special. Farrell grew up in the Roanoke Valley. He remembers making news reports for his grandmother with the weather and sports included. After years away, he said it was an honor to come back home. 
Me to come back home and work here in my hometown to give the sports stories and tell the stories of great athletes and coaches and even their families is something that I don't take for granted and I look at it as a blessing, but it's really something that I've wanted to do for years. Carroll says the best part of his job is building relationships with those in the community and building trust with both athletes and coaches. You know, Jermaine's coverage of high school sports is fantastic and really important as there are so many good uh, high school athletes and good kids. I mean, he walks our sidelines of football, uh, basketball games. He comes to Adam Ward. Everybody knows who this gentleman is. And I think it says a lot about his character because he's not only behind the microphone, the camera, um, and on TV every evening, but he builds those relationships with people. He says with so many wonderful stories and the great things athletes in the area are up to, things are never dull. And as for his future plans, just continue to give back, continue to share the stories because we're not done yet. And Roanoke, Imari Williams, WFXR News. Jermaine, it's always an honor just to stand next to you. How did it feel just to get that award? I tell you, it's an honor and a blessing. I want to thank the Roanoke chapter at SCLC for this great honor. Well, first, the Maroons, then the Panthers will meet a man breaking barriers in our local sports community. We're honoring black history when we come right back. We've told you about how Roanoke College recently made history hiring its first ever African American athletic director. But not long after that, well, Ferrum College did the same thing. Now, Hazel Marie Cleve Adams bleeds black and gold. He's no stranger to the Panthers, but he sees his new role as a true blessing. For Ferrum College athletic director and Radford native Cleve Adams, his transition from Panthers head football coach to AD has been overwhelming to him in a lot of ways, but also for the good. As a head coach, I know what's around the next corner. I, I understand the calendar, if you will. As the director of athletics, I don't know what I don't know at times when it comes to administrative duties and things of that nature, but I have a support team that is absolutely incredible. And the part I love about it more than anything else, I go from being responsible for a team to all teams and having that responsibility with all student athletes, I really enjoy it. Adams isn't a stranger to making history. He was the first African-American head football coach, not only at his alma mater of Ferrum, but also in the ODAC, but also at Danville's Averett University at that time when the Cougars were in the USA South Conference. Also, he was the first African-American head football coach for the conference. An unbelievable uh, accomplishment for me. 
and I take that responsibility very, very seriously. Overall, Adams has a unique perspective with the legacy he wants to leave at Ferrum. I want people to, to look back on my career and say that he made a difference in the lives of young people. He made a, a huge impact to the community that he was a part of. He cared, um, he had compassion. He wasn't perfect, but he understood the value of athletics to our community and he took that gift and he made a huge impact to the people around him. Hair discrimination is a part of a legacy of historic racism and discrimination that's been a part of our society. And believe it or not, in much of our country, it's still legal, but perhaps not for not much longer. That's up next. Welcome back, everybody. Now, in the 1960s, the Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination based on the color of a person's skin, but it left a major loophole, Hazel. That's Marie. right. In many states, it remains legal to discriminate against people who wear their hair in traditionally African or African American styles. But there's more momentum than ever to change that. Valerie Pritchett reports. Natural hair is amazing. Strands rooted in history. Stylist Andrea Fulton knows well. It's beautifully coiled, curly, curly hair from straight hair to curly hair. Cornrows, afros, and locks, just some of the versatility. I had to have my hair like really straight, you know, and in a specific style, especially like if you're thinking about like business meetings. McKee decided to use a natural protective hairstyle which is not always embraced. I love the big afro. It's unfortunate that someone has an opinion of what is beautiful and what isn't beautiful. A costly opinion. It is unfortunately still legal to not give someone a job opportunity, not hire them based off of their hairstyle. And that is unconscionable in this day and age. We know all discrimination is wrong. Pennsylvania House Speaker Joanna McClinton and Crown Act co-sponsor says the act passed the House and now it's in the Senate for consideration. Hair discrimination is a part of a legacy of historic racism and discrimination that's been a part of our society. Where do other states stand? Green shows where the Crown Act is law and prohibits discrimination based on hair type, texture or style. Yellow legislation is filed or pre-filed. Red indicates legislation has not been filed. On the national front. You hear it all the time. We see it all the time. 
uh, where young people were denied the opportunity to go to their prom or denied an opportunity to work in a certain uh, industry. Louisiana Congressman and Crown Act supporter Troy Carter Sr. says while it passed so the previous the Congress, it did not get far in the Senate and will be reintroduced this year. Recognizing that more and more people hopefully are beginning to realize that this is not a partisan issue. But it is a very personal issue to millions, especially the black community. It becomes a way to shut the door. It becomes a way to keep certain groups out of certain rooms, boardrooms. Fulton hopes the Crown Act will become law across the nation. Because we have to think about our young growing up thinking that something's wrong with their hair. Yep. Somebody's told them you have bad hair, you have, or your hair is ugly. Um, but I, we want them to understand how beautiful mm -hmm. the natural corals are. For Honoring Black History, I'm Valerie Pritchett, WFXR News. We appreciate you checking out our Honoring Black History special with we'll all, all these stories on WXRTV.com. Have a great night and happy Black History Month.